All right, well, uh, finish, finish up what we covered in the last two lectures, caching and transition into main memory today. And hopefully you're doing well on your homeworks and labs, so I'm going to skip these. But you received an email. We've changed the exam date to April 17th based on feedback that you had last time also. Uh, and we're taking into account your course feedback. I didn't get a chance to put it on the, in these slides, but I'll cover the feedback we received from you and how we're addressing uh, some of that. Uh, and actually, I'll have you another, uh, have another feedback form for you uh, to get your opinions because some of you actually want the lectures to continue. Uh, I'd like to get your feedback on that later on. But some of them you may want to make optional just for learning purposes. Okay, but midterm two is uh, on April 17th. And it'll be similar format as midterm one. And you can look at uh, past midterms. Everything is available from past years. Uh, so hopefully you'll pre prepare well. Last lecture, we wrapped up virtual memory cache interaction. So you know that very well, hopefully. And we've looked at improving cache and memory hierarchy performance, uh, different techniques, cheaper alternatives to more associativity, blocking and code reorganization, and memory level parallelism aware cache replacement. So I'll start with this. Uh, and uh, actually, we haven't covered enabling multiple access in parallel. That was what we intended to cover, so we'll cover that today. And we'll start main memory, another fascinating topic. So actually, we can. We can have a course on memory systems, and that could go on forever, probably. <laughs> OK, so we're going to cover this part of caching that we did not cover. But uh, just to jog your memory, uh, memory level parallelism is the idea of generating and servicing multiple axes in parallel. This is similar to instruction level parallelism, right? You process instructions in parallel. Similar to that, you process memory axes in parallel. Why? What is special about memory accesses? Because memory accesses take so long, right? It's easier to tolerate a, an add latency. Let's say add latency is three cycles, and a multiply latency is five cycles. It's easier to tolerate those latencies with additional operations, like independent adds. Whereas it's very hard to tolerate a 500 cycle memory latency by in executing many, many adds. It's easier to tolerate a 500 cycle memory latency by generating another memory access in parallel and overlapping those latencies. That's why memory level parallelism is a special case of instruction level parallelism. You generate multiple misses in parallel. And many techniques that are used in uh, today's process try to generate this memory level parallelism so that we can tolerate the memory latency. Fine-grained multi-threading, for example, enables memory latency tolerance because whenever you get a cache miss on one thread, you, generate, uh, you, can, get a, uh, you can overlap that latency with another cache miss from another thread. And if your memory access latency is 500 cycles, actually, that's, that's a, that, that was the reason for fine-grained multithreading. That was why it was developed, right? Initially in CDC 6600, the Control Data Corporation 6600, uh, they had a 10-cycle I.O. latency. And they, to tolerate that 10 cycles, which was very long at the time, they had 10 threads. Every cycle, you could generate a memory request from one thread so that you can overlap the latency of uh, the 10-cycle memory access. So that's the idea of memory level parallelism. Uh, and there are several techniques to improve memory level parallelism. Out of execution is one of them. And we'll cover run execution. Prefetching is actually another one of them, preloading the data early on with a hardware prefetcher, which we briefly covered last time. And uh, we saw that MLP actually varies. Some misses are isolated, in which case they're very costly on performance. Eliminating this improves your performance, whereas eliminating one of these parallel misses doesn't improve your performance because there is another miss that exists, right? Uh, you reduce the cost of each miss. Right? And we've seen that. I'm not going to go through this example, but we've seen an example where an optimal replacement policy that minimizes the number of misses doesn't actually minimize the number of uh, doesn't actually minimize the number of cycles to execute a program. Right? In this case, uh, in this cooked up example, which actually seems to happen in programs in the paper you're reading, uh, what happens is you get four misses. And the processor stalls for four memory access latencies, let's say. Whereas if you actually keep the blocks that are isolated, that are serviced in an isolated manner from memory in the cache, then you get six total misses. But because their latencies are overlapped, you get only two stalled. So that's the idea. That's why minimizing miss rate is not necessarily a good optimization strategy to optimize performance. So when you actually analyze performance, 
in your future systems, miss rate is not the only factor. It's really the latencies that also affect your system. OK. And you're reading this paper. How many of you have gotten a chance to read it? Zero? Because you're all working on the lab probably, right? Yes. That's a good prioritization strategy. <laughs> we'll look at prioritization mechanisms too soon in memory. OK. Uh, this is what I promised to cover. I'll go over it relatively quickly. But uh, if, you, if you want to generate multiple misses, you'd like to be able to handle multiple misses, right? Your cache needs to be able to support that. And in the, in the past, caches used to be blocking. So if you actually have uh, access to your cache, and if you get a cache miss, you need to have support for enabling multiple cache misses. So how do you have that support? Well, you need to be able to keep track of them, right? Which means that you need to have some separate structure around your cache in your control logic that keeps track of the outstanding misses, and that uh, basically orchestrates the data that comes from memory and places into the cache and supplies it to the processor. And there's a special structure uh, for that. It's called the uh, miss, miss buffers. And this is, uh, the, such caches are called non-blocking or lockup free caches. They don't block uh, when you have a miss. You can keep generating multiple misses and the cache keeps track of those multiple misses. That's the idea. So it's a simple idea. That's why I'm gonna go through this relatively fast. Uh, the question we answer is, if the processor can generate multiple cache misses, can the later access be handled while a previous miss is outstanding? And the answer is yes. But you need separate structures to, a uh, separate structure uh, where you keep, uh, you keep track of the status and the data of the misses that are being handled. And this, is, this has some names. Miss buffer is one name. Miss status handling or holding register is another name that was proposed in this paper. And many processors today uh, employ this technique. And the idea is simple. Basically, you have, uh, Whenever you get a cache miss, you allocate a register, miss status holding register, where you keep the address of the block that's missed. And any other cache access checks these registers to see if a miss to the same block is already pending. If a miss to the same block is already pending, you don't send another request downstream, right? There's no reason to because the block is already going to be transferred. So this saves bandwidth also. Uh, so if there is a, a new request is not generated, basically. If, the, if a miss uh, is pending and the needed data is available, then the data is forwarded to a later load. Uh, this requires buffering of these miss requests. And I've already given you this, so I'm going to skip this. But this is also called a miss buffer. Uh, it ca keeps track of outstanding cache misses. Also, it keeps track of pending load store accesses that refer to this missing block, especially if you're in the L1 level. So you can have these miss buffers at multiple levels, right? OK, this time it's at a more intuitive place. <laughs> so you have this L1 cache. And you also, in the control logic, you have the MSHRs. These are the pending misses to the next level. And then you have this L2 cache, hopefully bigger. And it also keeps track of pending misses to the next level. If you miss in the L2 cache, then uh, every, and holding register is allocated. And what is in this? Uh, in each entry, in each entry, you keep track of the uh, cache block address that's missed. And of course, ent entry has a valid bit. And potentially the data that's returned, right? And also some things else, especially at the L1 level. Well, maybe L in the L2 level, you don't need this. But which load instructions are waiting? Which, which instructions are waiting for this miss? waiting for this miss? And also, for which block are they waiting? Uh, for which sub-block? And for which word, or I'm going to call it maybe sub-block, are they waiting? Because at the L1 cache level, when the miss data returns, you'd like to wake up the instruction that's waiting for that data. Right? That's how you connect uh, data coming from the memory system to an instruction. This is, that's the function of the MSHRs. OK, well, what are the, uh, I will not go through this in detail, but you can imagine what fields you need to design such a structure. You need to have a valid bit, right? If there's no miss outstanding, none of this should be valid. Uh, you should have the cache block address uh, that's missing. 
and cache block address. You don't need the byte in block for that purpose. You need to have some control status bits to control the access, which sub-blocks have arrived, for example, right? Because you don't get all of the sub-blocks at the same time. Why? Because your memory, uh, the interface, the transfer uh, interface here may be much smaller than a cache block, right? Uh, you may, your cache block may be 64 bytes. The interface here may be 32 bytes. In two cycles, you transfer 64 bytes. And as you go down, the interface may be even smaller, especially at this interface, uh, uh, off-chip interface. This interface is much smaller, right? Because the, uh, you go through the pins here, and pins are expensive. And usually, in, in many current systems, this interface could be 64 bits, which is 8 bytes. But you have a 64-byte block, which means that every uh, you need 8 cycles to transfer, which means that you get, uh, you get uh, 8 bytes at a time in this L2MSHR, which means that you don't have the entire cache line uh, in one cycle. So this misstatus holding register usually stores which sub-blocks uh, have arrived, and data for each sub-block. And then you can do the write uh, to the cache uh, for the entire block right, in one cycle. OK? And also, for each pending load store, if this is, an, if this, if this is at the L1 level, uh, you need the data size, you need to byte and block, and destination register, or store buffer entry address, because you need to supply that data. And that's, uh, this is one example of the entry. Uh, this is an MSA, uh, this is a register entry. This is the block address. Uh, and uh, for each, uh, for, for that block, which loads or stores are actually waiting for that block? Right? And which part of the block that load or store is waiting for? Does that make sense? And so this is how the memory system interfaces with the processor. Again, I'll not go into detail, but this is relatively intuitive. You can design a circuit that actually, uh, that actually orchestrates this. Now, the question is, what happens when you run out of entries here? Uh, well, I guess let's look at the uh, details a little bit. On a cache miss, you search these MSHRs to see if there's a pending access to the same block. If you find one, uh, if, uh, if, uh, so when, when a load, or load instruction gets a cache miss, it searches the MSHRs with the address. Let's say this is the cache block address. If there is a pending miss to A, then it allocates one of the load store entries, if one exists. One may not exist, right? Then the load instruction stalls and waits. Uh, if not found, then it allocates a new misstatus holding register entry for A, and the cache generates a miss. And if there is no free entry, then the processor stalls. So it's important, if you are generating lots of misses, it's important to have a large number of entries in the misstatus holding registers right, to support large levels of memory level parallels. When a sub-block returns from the next level in main memory, then uh, the, at least at the L1 level, uh, we check uh, this, uh, the control logic checks which loads and stores are actually waiting for that sub-block. Remember in this figure, we had the block offset the load or store is waiting for. Because the cache block is 64 bytes, a load or store is waiting for only a part of the cache block, right? Maybe one of the words here, maybe word six. Right? That's the block offset, widen block. And uh, if there's a load waiting for that sub block, then uh, the misstatus holding register forwards the data to, that, to the load uh, unit or load store unit. Well, in case of stores, it's uh, you don't need to do anything. You, say, you can think of stores as differently, right? In fact, there are other ways of handling stores, as we've discussed. You could have a sectored cache. And uh, once the data for the sub-block actually returns and the load, and uh, load is issued, then you can deallocate the load store entry. You can deallocate uh, one of these, basically, because the sub-block has returned. You can actually write the sub-block in the cache or MSHR. So that's a, another design choice, right? When a sub-block comes back, do you write it immediately into the cache, or do you keep it in the MSHR until you get the entire block? That's a design choice. And you can imagine the design trade-offs. And if it's the last sub-block to arrive, you now deallocate the MSHR. Now you have the entire cache block arriving from memory. Okay? 
So I've gone through this relatively fast, but this should be relatively intuitive uh, to you. OK. Uh, so one last thing, I guess. When you design, so this enables lot, uh, multiple misses to uh, proceed in parallel uh, in, a, in a cache. And that's the idea of a non-blocking cache. One question for you is, when do you access these MSHRs? Uh, whenever you get a load store, uh, let's say you get a load from the processor, do you access the MSHR in parallel with the cache, or do you access it uh, in serial with the cache? Do you access the cache first, or do you, do you access them together? Any questions? Uh, any thoughts? What would you do? I guess it depends on your miss rate, right, from the cache. If your miss rate is really high, it's likely that you're going to, you may hit here. If your miss rate is really low, uh, then it probably doesn't make sense to search your miss uh, status holding registers. Right? So usually, these do not need to be on the critical path of the hit request, right? If you, if in, in the L1, L1 cache level, let's say your 90% of your access is hit in the L1 cache, only 10% miss, then there is no point in accessing the MSHRs in parallel with the cache. You're basically wasting energy. Right? So in a, de in a design, in a good design, you should not put the MSHRs on the critical path because they're handling the missing cases, misses from the cache. So which one is the common case, I guess? That, uh, is it the cache hit that's the common, ca common case, or is it the cache miss and MSHR hit? There's another uh, case here. You can have a cache hit or cache miss. And when there's a cache miss, the missing access can actually hit in the MSHR, which means that there's already a pending request to memory to the next level for that block. Or it could be an MSHR miss. So at the L1 level, this cache hit is the common case, right? Usually L1 caches have 90% hit rates. This is across a lot of workloads, of course. And this is not the common case. And in fact, uh, it really depends on your program if you have MSHR hits or not. OK? So you don't want to put the miss status holding registers on your critical path of access, especially at the L1 level. Because L1, uh, the access latency to L1 is very important, right? You would like to make it very quick. You would like to get the data very quickly. OK. Any questions on this? How to support miss buffers? OK. Let's look at, uh, there's another issue with uh, supporting multiple accesses in parallel. So this was supporting multiple misses in parallel. This enables us to access the cache and generate multiple misses and handle serve multiple misses in parallel, keeping track of those multiple misses. But how do you actually, we, we've seen uh, mechanisms that execute multiple instructions in parallel. Right? We'd like to do multiple loads or multiple stores in parallel also. So how do you actually design memories that can support that? And we've already seen that, seen how to do that, right? The idea was banking, for example, interleaving. We've seen in vector processors, for example, to get high bandwidth, which is the same problem here, you would like to have multiple ports to memory or multiple banks somehow. Let's take a look at how you implement it at the cache level also. Uh, actually, this is uh, what I'll describe to you will be general techniques that enable high bandwidth memories in general. So we'll see this, we'll see this in mem main memory also. In fact, if you think a little bit broadly, uh, all memories are almost the same. The, memories, the generalized memory structure that I showed you, the bank structure, that exists in pretty much all memories today. Like if you look at flash memory, it has a very similar structure to that. And you can bank flash memory also to enable multiple access in parallel. So let's take a look at uh, how do we ensure the cache can handle multiple access in the same clock cycle. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at the case where you can actually get, uh, access the cache and get, the get two pieces of data at the same time. And there are several solutions proposed for it. Uh, 
true multiporting, virtual multiporting, multiple cache copies, and banking. You've already seen banking, and we'll cover this in a lot more detail uh, soon. But true multiporting is really the true way of uh, enabling multiple access in parallel. Right? Basically, this is your, uh, in this case, it's an SRAM cell, right? Uh, you have multiple read or write ports. Instead of having a single port, which means that you have a single word line that enables uh, the reading of that cell f uh, through a, a set of bit lines, you have two of these word lines. And you can address these word lines independently. Right? You have two address decoders, basically, connected to the same SRAM cell. Similarly, you can imagine the same thing for DRAM, although that'll be a little bit harder, right? Which one, which one actually discharges the capacitor? So I'll let you think about that. But for an SRAM cell, it's easier to do. Uh, basically, you, can, you, you have two address decoders. Uh, now you can actually do uh, multiple reads in parallel. In fact, people have designed uh, memories or register files that have, I believe, 32 ports or so. Now what is the upside of this? Now you have truly concur concurrent access. Although we're, we're going to qualify this, right? What happens if you're reading and writing in, the uh, in different ports at the same time? You have a problem, right? Or what happens if you're writing to the same location in different ports at the same time? You don't want to allow that. And we're going to fix that problem with peripheral circuitry. So it's a, and it enables truly concurrent read accesses. You, can re uh, you, you have two instructions that happen to read from the same location. Uh, and this could be a register file, right? Uh, that happened to read from the same, same register. Now both of them can proceed because they access different ports. What is the downside of this? There must be a downside, right? If you look at the circuit. Yes? It increases the capacitance and the latency? Exactly, yes. Basically now you're connecting multiple of these bit lines and transistors and every, every circuitry that's connected to this uh, line, right, to the cell, which means that you've increased the capacitance, which means that you've increased the latency of access. And also you've increased the power as well, and you've increased the area as well to be able to actually drive all of these, uh, uh, to be able to drive all of these ports, you need to increase the area of the cell. So this comes at a cost. You cannot keep the access latency the same. Okay, uh, what about read and write to the same location at the same time? Uh, let's take a look at that. And you need to handle that with peripheral logic. There's no way you can handle that, right? If you're reading and writing, if you already sent the write data and you're trying to read uh, the cell at the same time, you cannot do that with this. So you need to have some peripheral logic. Peripheral logic, what is that peripheral logic? Basically you have some circuitry that detects that while you're reading from a, a port, you're also writing to that port. And if that's the case, then you only allow one of them to happen. Right? You cannot allow both of them to happen. And this is one example. Uh, this is a high level example. You have dual port cells. You have a left uh, address decoder and right address decoder. And they, if they both happen to generate the same address and one of them is writing to the address and one of them is reading to the address, you basically stop one of them. And you, you have a semaphore that uh, uh, arbitrates between the ports. And you can look at this. This is just one example. You can imagine other ways of potentially implementing this, right? Basically, this is for one cell. You have a request and you have a write request and both of them cannot go at the same time. Okay? Okay, so that was true multiporting. And uh, you, uh, if you really want to do multiple instructions in parallel, you need true multiporting in a register file, right? Because all of the other solutions that we will see uh, have some issues, right? But there, uh, the true multiporting is expensive, so uh, alternatives have been developed for it. One is virtual multiporting. So you don't, if you think of true multiporting, you have multiple ports in space. Whereas virtual multiporting gives you multiple ports in time. You do the first act, if you need to access the, uh, the same register twice, in a cycle, you do the first access in the first half of the cycle, and the next access in the next half of the cycle. Sounds great, right? That way you have only one port and you timeshare that port. Uh, 
Of course, each access needs to be significantly shorter than the clock cycle now, right? Or you're, you just uh, increase your clock cycle to enable this. So this was actually used in Alpha 21 to 64, uh, the EV6 caches. Uh, uh, they, their cache uh, was clocked. Uh, I'm not sure. It was, uh, the, it was clocked at 2x the processor's clock cycle time. That way you could access the cache twice in one processor cycle. That way you would get two ports. It's nice, right? If you can do this, of course. The question is, is this scalable? What if you want to do eight accesses per cycle? Well, now your register file needs to be, or your cache needs to be clocked eight times uh, at the speed you're generating memory requests, right? So this is not a very scalable solution if you want to uh, have multiple ports. But this is a solution that was employed. If you can employ the solution, it's a, it gives you two ports for free, right? So what is another way? Uh, we don't want to have the latency penalty of uh, to multi-porting, but we still want to enable parallel accesses. Another way is actually have multiple copies of your cache, right? Or have multiple copies of your memory. And that's the idea here. You have two copies. Each of them has one port. Let's look at the load ports first. Uh, now these loads can proceed in parallel, right? The problem is stores need to update both caches now, both copies because you don't want to have inconsistency between these two copies, okay? So this was actually used in Alpha 21164, the previous generation of Alpha. They wanted to have two cache ports uh, because uh, they, they, they were able to generate two memory access in parallel. Uh, it was a, a four-wide in-order processor. And they did not want to multiport the cache, truly multiport the cache. So they had, they, copy, they had two copies of the same cache. Now they could support two loads per cycle. Of course, when you just store, now you can support only one store per cycle if you have one port, right? Uh, how scalable is this? What if you want to add eight ports again? Well, eight, eight, eight cache copies, that's a lot of area, right? So you actually have a lot of redundancy in this solution. But it does give you latency benefits, right? Because each copy has only a single port. And also the scalability is limited by how fast you can do the stores, right? Because stores need to update all of the caches. Okay. Yeah, store operations basically form a bottleneck and area is proportional to ports, so it's not that scalable. And uh, the last solution that we've covered is banking. And this is very commonly employed in all systems today. Uh, the idea is, it's also called interleaving. Basically, you have, you partition the memory space into n partitions. In this case, it's two partitions. And you basically interleave the addresses to separate banks. Basically, bits in address determines which bank an address maps to. Make sense? And we've seen this, right, uh, for uh, the Cray system. And we're going to look at this in, in more detail in this lecture. So even addresses are hosted by this bank, all addresses are hosted by this bank, and your address decoder directs the requests to the right bank. So what are the upsides? There's no increase in the data store area in this case, right? So this is very similar to virtual multiporting, I guess. Virtual multiporting also doesn't increase the uh, data store area. That's the only solution that does not increase the data store area other than banking. Uh, the downside is what happens if you actually, uh, if both addresses are even? Both addresses that you're requesting are even in the same cycle. Well, you need to have some logic that handles that, right? That's called a bank conflict. Then you, cannot, you have to serialize the accesses. And we've seen this problem. You cannot satisfy multiple accesses to the same bank. Well, there's another thing that's here, right, that I showed you here. Uh, you have, let's say your load address, you have a load that happens to go to bank one, but it happens to access from this port. And you have another load that needs to go to bank zero and happens to access from this port. From each port, you should be able to access any bank. Right? So you need to have some interconnection network here that enables each port to be able to access any bank. And that's uh, if you want to have full connectivity from ports to banks, that needs to be a crossbar or that needs to be a point-to-point -point connection. 
So that is another complexity that comes with banking that's not present in the other solutions. Okay? So bank conflicts, uh, well, we're going to look at bank conflicts a lot, but the, these, are, these happen when two axes are to the same bank. Then the question is how can you reduce them? How do you optimize the performance of a memory that's banked? And we've seen that that's been a, a common problem in vector processors. You want to minimize the bank conflicts. And how do you minimize the bank conflicts? Well, data mapping is one solution, right? Uh, hardware can map the data, or software can map the data, or the programmer can map the data such that accesses can proceed in parallel. And we've seen random, we've talked about randomization, right? Address randomization tries to randomize the addresses, the mapping of the addresses to banks such that you have a uniform, uh, uh, uniform distribution of the locations in different banks. And the hope is to minimize bank conflicts. Okay, so I guess let me take a step back. Interleaving actually enables one other thing, right? The banking idea. It's not only for parallel accesses, but if you think about this, instead of building a monolithic memory, we're partitioning the memory. Right? So it enables latency reduction as well. And this is a general technique in designing memories. Instead of having a monolithic memory, uh, M, we're going to divide into some number of banks. And each of these memories is much faster now, right? Because it's smaller. So banking is a technique for uh, not only multiple accesses, enabling multiple accesses, but also uh, enabling uh, faster accesses. So its goal is multiple. Reduce the latency of memory array access, as well as enable multiple accesses in parallel. So you get both latency reduction and parallelism with banking. And this is a very powerful technique. So if you look at memories today, uh, they consist of these, uh, you, can, you can think of this uh, monolithic array, and you can think of this as a subarray. And even banks consist of smaller subarrays internally. So if you look at this bank zero, to enable fast access, it, internally it looks like these. And you have a, you could call this a sub-bank, right? <laughs> and you could go even down further, right? You could have a sub-bank that has smaller sub-sub-banks. And memory, existing memories are structured this way. Even bank is an ab abstraction today. Why? Because we would like to be, build very large memories. And you cannot get fast with very large. In fact, sometimes your power increases if you want to, uh, so uh, remember, you could have a single bank for a one gigabyte memory. <laughs> and one gigabyte memory may have many, many rows here, right? Uh, uh, the problem is, if you would like to uh, access one location, you need to drive this row down. And it takes time to do that, but it also takes power to do that. These bit lines that you drive are very po uh, power hungry. If you divide your memory into these smaller chunks and drive one of these bit lines here, it's much less power hungry. It's also much faster. So that's the idea. Banking, uh, its goal is to reduce latency of memory array access, enable multiple access in parallel at the same time. And that's the idea. Divide the array into multiple banks or multiple subarrays that can be accessed independently. And you could do it, again, that's another design choice. Do you do it in the same cycle or in consecutive cycles? Do you start an access in each of these banks in the same cycle or in consecutive cycles? It depends, again. Uh, your, uh, uh, it depends on whether you need the data, both data pieces of data at the same time. OK. Then the issue in all of these memories is how do you map the data to different banks to minimize the conflicts? You don't want multiple accesses to go to the same bank all the time. OK? OK, maybe we should start with main memory now. Now that you've, you have the building block, if you look at main memory, it actually looks like this. <laughs> any, any kind of memory will look like this as you increase its size. 
OK. So if you look at main memory, this is uh, what it looks like in the system. And we're going to cover this part of the system. And this is my abstraction here. If you, you can think of the entire memory system this way. You, have an, you input an address, n bits, and you get some data, k bits. And you have a chip enable and a write enable. And internally, this memory is, consists of subarrays that look exactly like this. And this is the memory bank organization, so I'm going to skip these slides that you already know. Right, this, is what, uh, this is what the memory will look like. And even this will be an abstraction for us, because internally it'll look like this. And this is SRAM versus DRAM. So let's look at some fundamental concept first. What is the physical address space? It's the maximum size of main memory. This is the total number of uniquely identifiable locations. Right? And we'll also have physical addressability. This is the minimum size of data in, uh, in memory that can be accessed. So you could have byte addressable memories, word addressable memories, or 64-bit addressable memories. And we will have different addressabilities in the DRAM subsystem itself, physically. There's also addressability at the ISA level, right? At the ISA level, your memory is byte addressable, for example. That's the address generated by the load. But at the cache level, for example, you get a 64 byte. It's a six, it could be 64 byte addressable. And this depends on the abstraction level of the implementation itself. And we will see that there are different, uh, different transfer granularities uh, within these subarrays and across the chips. Alignment will not cover that right now, but the question uh, uh, that, uh, that you've seen earlier in the course is, does the hardware support unaligned access to transparent, uh, transparently to the software? And you know, you know that MIPS does not, support it on, uh, does not support unaligned access, right? or at least in the same cycle. And interleaving, uh, you know the concept. Okay. So interleaving, this is one example of interleaving. So I've shown you this uh, memory figure right here. Interleaving, you can think of interleaving as putting two of those chips, right? You have bank zero and bank one. Each of them have chip enables and write enables. And they, in this case, they share a common bus. And you can start one access in one, uh, one bank in one cycle, and the next access in the next bank in the next cycle, and the data comes back pipelined uh, from, uh, from the banks. So there's control logic that controls when the data comes back from different banks. Right? So that's one example. Uh, the key question here is, again, which banks do consecutive, in uh, consecutive words in memory are mapped to? That's the, idea of interleaving the data. Basically, how do we interleave the words across the banks? This is just one example. And we've covered this earlier, but uh, let me go over this again, I guess. If you have this physical address, let's say it's 13 bits. And I believe I've made this example such that you have uh, a 13 bit physical address. But you can have an interleaving scheme that looks like this. Right? Basically, you pick which bit uh, do you pick in the physical address determines uh, which bank uh, the data is stored at. Right. So in this case, I guess let me draw this in a little bit more detail here. Oh, there it is. So if you look at this, you get four bytes. The interface that you have to the bank is four bytes, right? And this is bank zero, and this is bank one. And this is also four bytes. So one way of interleaving data is uh, we have a 13-bit address space. And the, the two bits here determine which of these bytes out of the four uh, do you, are you actually addressing, if this is byte addressable, right? So you cannot interleave data in a granularity that's finer than the data that's supplied by the bank. Does that make sense? Because when you access the bank, you get four bytes. You cannot say byte, byte zero goes here and byte one goes here. OK. And this is your bank uh, ID in the top interleaving case. So you have one bit here, uh, 0, 1, 2, bit 2, selecting the bank. And this is your row ID, let's say. So in this case, uh, Byte 0 starts from here, 
byte four maps to here, right? And then byte, let's see, byte eight maps to here, byte 12 maps to here. And then byte 16, byte 20, dot, dot, dot. So it's interleaved at a granularity of four bytes. Make sense? So if you look at this, you could choose a banquet from here also, right? That's another alternative interleaving mechanism. So we have these two bits here. And we pick the top byte, uh, uh, top bit as the bank ID bit. How does your memory layout look like in this case? It certainly doesn't look like this, right? Basically, now you partition your memory. The bottom half of the address space goes here. The top half of the physical address space goes here. Right? So 0, uh, byte 4, byte 8, byte 12, byte 16, dot, 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 all the way up to uh, byte, I guess, what is this, 2 to the, is it 12? Yeah, 2 to the 12 minus 1 goes here, right? And byte 2 to the 12, I think, or is it byte 2 to the 13 minus 1, right? And byte 2 to the 13 goes here. Make sense? So which one is a better interleaving scheme? Usually the finer, uh, the bits that you choose uh, for the bank that has higher entropy, higher, higher probability to change is a better uh, bit to pick, right? Otherwise your probability of bank conflict increases significantly. What if you want to access, uh, what if you allocated your memory such that you have a page and you want to access the same page. You want to have two, uh, uh, two accesses in parallel to the same page. Well, uh, if, bo if the page, the entire page is mapped to two different rows here, then you get a bank conflict. Whereas if you have interleaved your data in a finer grain, it's more likely that you're going to access these two banks in parallel. That's why your data mapping map matters significantly. And there's another interleaving scheme here where you pick the bank bit somewhere here, right, in the middle. And we've seen that you can do address randomization. You can you actually use a hash function to minimize the address conflict. But many systems usually pick the bank bits from the bottom bits of the address, physical address. Again, why? Because the bottom bits are more likely to change, have more entropy. OK. So before going into the DRAM system, let's look at some uh, things that we've covered already. You remember that we, Cray 1 had 16 banks, right? And because we had 11 cycle bank access latency, and they interleaved consecutive words in consecutive banks. And the goal was to be able to supply uh, or over, uh, supply uh, one word every cycle, right? So you can start one access and finish one access every cycle. Now this was a design where banks, you could pipeline accesses to banks. You don't get multiple uh, words in parallel in the same cycle. But you can actually operate them in parallel, as I said earlier, right? You can actually start multiple accesses per cycle. In this case, you should be able to uh, have multiple address buses that are going to the banks, right? You can actually also uh, get data. So this is one design of the bank. If you want to be able to uh, start multiple uh, start, uh, so this is the pipeline design. Here, uh, they, uh, the banks share the data bus. The banks also share the address bus. I haven't showed it here, but there's an address bus here that is uh, connected to the banks. That's why you cannot do multiple accesses in parallel. You need to pipeline multiple accesses uh, in consecutive cycles. Now, if you want multiple access in parallel, now you need to have separate address and data buses from the banks, right? You still have partition address space, bank zero, bank one, but you can independently access these. Of course, you need to have some peripheral logic, right, to route the right address to the right data, uh, and also uh, to ensure that uh, you don't have a bank conflict, right? I'm, I'm ignoring that peripheral logic here. But if you want to be able to do multiple accesses in per, per cycle, you need multiple address and data buses, per bank address and data bus. That's the cost of multiple access per cycle. That's why Cray had uh, 
a single address was on a single data bus. When does this make sense? Well, if this address bus and data bus is very costly, then you would like to share the address and data bus across the multiple banks. Right? And this is very costly as we've seen in DRAM, right? If these are actually connected to the pins, they're very costly. And a lot of the design decisions uh, that are made in DRAM, as we will see, is because of this, because these address and data buses are very costly. Okay, so the cost of this is, is additional data and address buses. So if you look at uh, Uh, the design decision that's made on chip, that's very different. Right? Because these buses are less costly on chip, right? in a register file, for example. Well, there are two reasons. In a register file or an L1 cache, the buses are less costly. You can have more wires. And also, you do want to supply the data very, very quickly. Because any si uh, you would like to ideally supply the data in one cycle right, to the processor, because the processor needs that data very quickly. Whereas at the memory level, the access latencies are 500 cycles or so anyway. So it's OK maybe to delay the next piece of data by five cycles. Right? You can tolerate that latency. Whereas at the L1 cache level, uh, you have ample wires, and you cannot tolerate that latency very well. So modern superscalar processors have L1 caches, uh, as well as register files that have fully independent banks. So they look like this. And of course, they have peripheral logic too, uh, which means a cache controller right? or bank controller, bank controllers. Uh, whereas at the DRAM side, at the memory side, far away from the processor, it looks more like this. You share the address and data buses. Okay, so this is uh, the bank abstraction, and I'll, it's again the same thing, right? It's, it's, it's just like memory, and memory consists of many of these banks. And even this is an abstraction. If you look at a bank uh, in DRAM, and this, is, this was the example I showed you, 1,000 one rows, 32 bits, uh, uh, interface to the bank. Uh, the 32 bits actually come from multiple chips in DRAM. It turns out these pins are expensive, and to minimize cost, DRAM manufacturers make that interface much smaller. So each of each chip supplies 32 divided by n chips, uh, n bits, and you have n chips. So if you look at this bank, it actually looks something like this. It is distributed across across multiple chips, and different chips supply different parts of those 32 bits. So the top eight bits are supplied by this chip. The bottom eight bits are supplied by this chip. And intermediate eight bits are supplied by this chip. And these are different physical chips. Now this is called a rank. The idea is this is a set of chips that respond to the same command and the same address at the same time with different pieces of data. Why? Because the pins are costly on each chip, so you aggregate multiple chips and operate them in parallel, uh, such that you get multiple pieces of data, a bigger, a wider interface at a lower cost. Does this make sense? So it's like a rank of soldiers, right? You send a command, and they all respond to the command with different pieces of data. Okay. Well, producing an 8-bit per ch pin chip is cheaper than producing a 32-bit uh, per pin chip. And that's the idea. You produce an 8-bit per ch pin chip, but control and operate them as a rank of four chips so that you can get 32 bits. So keep this in mind. We'll cover this rank again, but this is uh, another fundamental principle. You would like to minimize the cost of each chip, and to be able to do that, you would like to minimize the pins so you have a smaller interface. But you can still get a wider interface to the processor by aggregating these multiple chips and operating them in parallel. So if you look at a DIM today, this is what a DIM looks like. So when, if you put slots on your uh, DIM's uh, memory in your computer, this is what it will look like. OK? Uh, I think maybe let's take a break. I'll just give you uh, that organization. But as I told you, uh, the entire memory looks very similar. Right? You could think of a channel as an abstraction, as a big memory, and a DIM that is part of the channel. And DIM actually consists of multiple ranks. And a rank consists of multiple chips that look like this, that operate in parallel. 
And a chip consists of multiple banks. And a bank, as, you, as we've seen, consists of multiple, a two-dimensional array of rows and columns. But maybe I'll stop here and we'll take a break because we're going to jump into the DRAM system and cover, cover a lot of things here. Do you want to do a five-minute break? Let's be back at 127. Well, let's look at how this DRAM system is organized. Again, this is, this is a fascinating part of the system, and a lot of the uh, courses don't cover this system, so hopefully you'll enjoy this uh, part. Because the way I think of it is DRAM is uh, kind of an orphan. It's kind of abandoned. Right? You have this processor, and a lot of the computer architecture course are processor-centric, and you have the storage system, disks, a lot of these systems courses are storage centric. DRAM is kind of in the middle, right? It's a very important part of the system, but nobody, <laughs> nobody uh, likes it in the sense that uh, uh, nobody wants to own it. <laughs> but DRAM is really uh, a central bottleneck in many systems, and today we'll cover uh, why it is so. Uh, or how it is designed first, and then we'll see, we'll see some of the issues with it. So if you look at a bank, I've given you this example, but this is a little bit more detailed with the right numbers, if you will. If you look at a DRAM bank, a common DRAM bank looks like this. Basically, you have an array of cells organized into columns and rows, and two to the 10 columns is not uncommon, and two to the 14 rows is not uncommon. So it's 16,000 rows. So this has two to the 24 bytes. Right? That's a lot of bytes. And uh, the interface is you get eight bits, and eight bits is actually your column. One column consists of eight bits in this case. So a row address needs to be 14 bits because you have two of the 14 rows, and you have a latch for the row address. And column address needs to be 10 bits because you have two of the 10 columns. Right? And each column has eight bits. And you have a row buffer, which is a sense amplifier. Right? You amplify uh, each cell in the same row. And you know what this row buffer looks like. It's, a, uh, it's essentially an SRAM circuit. It's, it amplifies the signal that's coming from the um, DRAM cell. And the purpose of this column address latch is, or column address logic is to select uh, the appropriate column from this row buffer. Basically, you, have, you can think of this as a big mux, large mux that picks the right eight bits. And this is the interface of the chip. Uh, basically, you get the address from the DRAM controller, and address bits are shared between the row and the column, and you know why, because the pins are expensive again. That's why we want to share the address bits instead of supplying the entire address in one, uh, in one shot, which requires 24 bits. Now we have only 14 bits, right? Uh, there's also other address bits that select which bank. Right? There needs to be some bank bits here, which I'm not shown here. And this is the data in or out bits. Uh, this is actually a bidirectional bus that, as we will see in the next uh, slide, uh, and this is 8 bits. Again, we would like to minimize the cost of this, so in the interface is very low. And there also needs to be a command. Uh, again, uh, the controller needs to tell uh, the DRAM bank, oh, I'm sending you the row address, so activate this row. Activate is one command. Right? Uh, now give me this data. Read is another command. I'm sending you this column address, read from this column. That's another com command. A DRAM chip consists of multiple of these banks that share the address, data, and command buses. Uh, I've, I've already told you this, but this is, this is a page mode DRAM. Why it's called page mode? Page is an unfortunate name, actually, because we have virtual pages, right? It's not the same page, really, here. It's really row mode DRAM. Basically, a DRAM row is also called a DRAM page. That's why this. Uh, DRAM looks like uh, it's called a page mode DRAM. And sense amplifier is also called the row buffer or page buffer. So if, if once you go out in the industry, if somebody says DRAM page, it's really a DRAM row. And it has nothing, normally nothing to do with a virtual page. So each address is a row, comma, column pair. And when you access a closed row, which means that the row is not in the row buffer, what you need to do is uh, the controller needs to send an activate command to the DRAM bank, which activates that row. You, it brings the entire row into the row buffer. And then once the activate is done, uh, the controller needs to send a read or write command that reads or writes the column in the row buffer, along with the column address. 
And once that's done, if you're done with that access, you need to pre-charge the, uh, pre the row by sending a pre-charge command. Basically, pre-charge command closes the row and prepares the bank for the next access. Make sense? You've seen this before, but you actually need to send these three different commands separately at different times to enable one access. Well, I guess one access is really done after read and write, but you enable the array for the next access with the pre-charge. So DRAM control actually sends all of these commands. When you access SRAM, all of these happen in, at the same time. So there are no di different commands. Okay, if you access an open row, which means that if the row that you're accessing, if the row address that you need is already in the row buffer, then the DRAM controller doesn't need to activate, right? Because the address is already in the row buffer. So somebody needs to keep track of this, right? DRAM controller needs to keep track of which row is actually open in the row buffer so that you can reduce the latency uh, in, in, when you access an open row because you don't need to send an activate command when you access an open row. And I've shown you this earlier, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. But basically you have this row buffer abstraction. Initially it's empty. If the controller needs to access row zero, column zero, it first needs to activate row zero, which brings the row here. And then it needs to send a read command to column zero. And the DRAM chip responds with the data at the column zero and sends it back to the controller. Now let's say the controller needs to access row zero column one. The DRAM controller already knows that row zero is open in the row buffer, which means that there needs to be some state uh, that's kept per bank, saying which row is open in that bank. And the controller sends column one to the row. In this case, the DRAM controller figures out that it's a row buffer hit, and it only sends the column address and the read command. That way you don't need to activate the same row again. Right? In fact, you cannot do that, right? because you've destroyed the contents of the row. You've discharged all the capacitors. Right? Okay, let's say the controller needs to access another column in the same row. Again, this is a row buffer hit, and you need to only send the column address and the read command. If the controller needs to access row one, then this is a row buffer conflict. So you think of this as a cache, right? Now this is a one entry cache in the DRAP. And the controller keeps track of what row is actually cached in DRAM. You can think of that as an abstraction of a cache. The problem is uh, when you actually need to evict the entry in this row buffer, you need to pre-charge the array. So you cannot just get rid of the contents here. You need to pre-charge the array. You need to send a pre-charge command. So if you need to access row one, there's a row buffer conflict. So the controller sends a pre-charge command, which pre-charges the array which also clears the row buffer. I'm not going into the next level of circuit abstraction, but if you're interested, we can talk about it uh, later on, uh, which clears the row buffer. Now, the row buffer is not driven by the uh, access transistor, uh, but by the capacitors in the row. And the controller now can send the next row address, row one, and an activate command. And the DRAM chip responds by bringing the row into the row buffer, row one into the row buffer. And the controller then sends the column address zero along with the read command. And the DRAM chip responds uh, by muxing out the column uh, through the column mux. Okay, so this is the operation of a bank. A DRAM chip consists of multiple banks. And in synchronous DRAM, I mean, you could imagine multiple banks, but uh, it's usually between two and 16. Because as you add more banks, what happens, right? You have more capacitance on this bus, right? So your latency also increases. Banks share the command address and data buses, and the chip itself is a narrow interface, as I told you, four to 16 bits per read. And this is from a data sheet that's relatively old. I believe it's from Micron's data sheet. But this is what a DRAM chip looks like at a schematic level, at a high level. It's essentially what I showed you, right? If you look at the bank, this is bank zero, right? And they tell us uh, it has 16,000 rows uh, organized into 256 columns where each column is 32 bits. Actually, their interface is a little bit different. Uh, the interface to the chip is actually eight bits. Each column is really eight bits, but what they do in the chip itself is they bring down 32 bits and buffer it uh, somewhere here in, the, uh, in this logic. And then if you access, uh, this is called, the, uh, they basically prefetch the next uh, 24 bits whenever you access it. Uh, eight bits. That's the idea. So that they can give you more bandwidth. 
that way. But the interface to the chip is really 8 bits if you look at this. And you have eight banks in this case. And you see the sense amplifiers. And you see that different uh, banks have different sense amplifiers. And this is the column decoder. This is the row decoder. Each bank has its row address, latch, and decoder. And uh, this is the row address mux. Uh, and this is the address bits that are shared. Uh, if, you, if you look at this, you have 14 address bits to address the row as well as the column. And you have three address bits for bank address, right? Bank zero through three, zero through two. And I guess what else is interesting here? There, you know, we're not going to cover all of this. There are circuit level issues, but if you look at this, this is what you get as a column: 32 bits. And these 32 bits are latched in the end, and the bottom two bits of the column address uh, select one of the eight bits within those 32 bits. So this is to enable high bandwidth. Internally, you prefetch data that's larger than the width of the chip uh, in order to enable multiple accesses per cycle, multiple 8-bit transfers per cycle. Make sense? So now you know what the internals look like. And there's a write, there's write circuitry, of course, so you need to be able to drive the writes inside and drive the writes all the way uh, to the memory array. So you have different drivers for writes. And there's also a refresh counter, as you see here, and we're going to cover refresh. Uh, you know that DRAM requires refresh because you leak, uh, the, the cells leak, the capacitors leak, and periodically you need to refresh. Then the question is, what happens if you're accessing while you're also refreshing, right? Well, you shouldn't do that, right? The controller shouldn't allow an access while uh, the chip is being refreshed. So we'll see issues related to that. So it's a complex chip. Uh, now let's take a look at the rank. Uh, as I told you, multiple chips are operated together to form a wide interface. It's only eight bits. Right, but we want actually a much wider interface, 64 bits. So how do we get that? Well, that's what we do. All chips uh, respond to a single command, and they share address and command buses, but provide different data. Well, it's, it's actually parallel. Uh, uh, the data buses are parallel. Address and command buses are exactly the same. Right? And a DRAM module consists of one or more ranks. It's also called dual inline memory module. And this is what you plug into your motherboard. Okay. I think this is clear. And this is what a 64-bit wide DIMM with one rank looks like. Right? You have eight of these chips. Each of them provide eight bits. And this is another way of looking at it. So what's the advantage of actually having uh, aggregating multiple of these chips? Well, now you, uh, you, uh, you have a wide interface. right? This is a way of getting wide interface without actually increasing the pin count in each chip. There's uh, there's some increase in the pin count over here, right? But that's a different uh, design. If you look at the system design, maybe you want to optimize the system in a different way. But I'll let you think about that. We're not going to cover that. But it enables you to have a wide interface. It also enables you more capacity. Right? It also uh, gives you flexibility. By aggregating these multiple chips and operating them in a single rank, the memory controller doesn't need to deal with each chip. Right? You really need to deal with multiple chips. The disadvantage, the disadvantage of granularity now, right? Once you've aggregated these chips uh, together, you cannot access only eight bits, right? You can get only, you can get 64 bits at a time. What if you want only eight bits, one byte? Well, too bad, you're going to get 64 bits. So you're going to waste some energy, and you're going to discard whatever, uh, the rest that you don't need. It turns out, actually, this is important going forward into the future because energy is a very uh, important constraint. Pa in the past, uh, the designs were optimized for performance. But going forward, energy is very important. So even this energy uh, waste is important. If you want to access a byte, why are you bringing in 64 bytes? Why, uh, if you want to access a byte, why are you bringing in 64 bytes? If you want to access 8 bits, why are you bringing in 64 bits? And in fact, let's go back a little bit. If you look at this, the organization of this memory is also inefficient going forward into the future. You're bringing in 16,300, well, no, that's, that's wrong. You're bringing in 8,192 bits. What if you're going to access only one byte there? That's a lot of bits to move, right? And that consumes a lot of energy. So I'll let you think about the implications of this going forward. But uh, as architects of the future, think about how to redesign potentially these chips. 
when energy is the constraint, not necessarily performance. OK, so the granularity is a disadvantage. Accesses cannot be smaller than the interface width, which means that now you have energy waste. Now you can also do multiple dims. Uh, I'm not going to cover this in detail. When we, when we actually look at interconnection networks, you'll probably understand this better. But uh, if you want high capacity, you don't want to have one dim, but you want to have many, many dims. Right? You have multiple dim slots in your uh, motherboard. Right? And they're connected in some manner. And this is one possible topology. This is a mesh topology, even though it doesn't look like a mesh. It's like a messy mesh here in this figure. But uh, it, having multiple DIMMs and interconnecting them somehow enables higher capacity. Right. One way of interconnecting them would be uh, in a daisy chain manner, right? You guys know about daisy chains? Basically, you pass the address, and there's only one bus that connects them. And actually, fully buffered DIMM uh, that was uh, one of the DRAM standards, uh, or DIMM standards, does exactly this. It's kind of extinct right now, but the idea is you have one dim here, and you have the next dim here, and the next dim here, and the next dim here, and addresses may be located, and address may be located here, 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 and you have another uh, uh, interleaving problem here, right? Maybe your byte zero is here, byte one is here, byte two is here. Well, maybe not bytes, right? This is 64 bytes. Maybe the First 64 bytes is here, second 64 bytes is here, third 64 bytes is here, and th fourth 64 bytes is here. And if you need to access this, your latency to access this DIM is much longer than the latency to access this DIM. And there, is ne there needs to be a controller that manages all of these accesses. Right? So that's how you get high capacity, by aggregating more of these DIMs together. Now the downside is, of course, to be able to scale the capacity of the system, uh, you need to have a good network to access these different chips. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover some of that, and that's a difficult problem. OK, so you get higher capacity disadvantages. If you want to scale the size, now you have more complexity. And if you do not have complexity, well, here, even here you need to have complexity. Right? You need to have some logic that says, oh, I cannot access. Uh, the, the, the address I'm looking for is not in this stem, so go to the next stem. Go to the next stem. Go to the next stem. So there's some buffering. That's, that's the reason why this was called fully buffered DIM. There's some buffer here. And I believe it was called AMB, advanced memory buffer. And these are basically little controllers that figure out where the address is and uh, send the data back on this daisy chain. And it looks simple, right? You don't have a lot of connections. But now the problem is your latency here is much higher. And your power in these controllers uh, is high as well. If you want a more sophisticated interconnect, for example, you can have point-to-point -point interconnect. You can have a DRAM controller that's connected independently of to the, all of these DIMMs, right? Well, that's also more complex, right? Because you have a lot of connections now. And if this DRAM controller is at the off-chip boundary, well, too bad. Now you've increased your, uh, uh, your pin, number of pins. Or you could partition the pins across these different DIMMs, in which case your latency increases to each DIMM, right? So you can say, I want to keep the interface at 64 bits, and I'm going to partition this. Now you have 16 bits in each of these. But your latency to access a cache line increases now, because you can, you can only use 16 bits to transfer from one DIMM, right? OK, so there are a lot of design choices related to this. But the goal is to achieve high capacity, but it comes at, a, it comes at complexity. OK. DRAM channels. Uh, channel is another uh, level of the DRAM system. So if you look at this, uh, all of the DIMMs are actually connected via a single channel uh, to the controller. Basically, a channel is a set of address, command, and data buses. And everything. Uh, that uh, is under that channel shares the address, command, and data buses. In this case, you look at this, you have two independent channels, right? Which is two memory controllers. You can also have dependent channels. You can have a single memory controller, and uh, it can control a 64-bit channel here and a 64-bit channel here, and they can be operated in lockstep. 
Again, the goal would be to get wider interface. Then it would look like a rank, right? Except you're controlling two different channels with the same controller in lockstep. So that, that's obviously simpler, but now you, have, you, do, you cannot have independence. Right? Independence enables fully parallel access to the memory system. Right? You can get 64 bits from here and a totally different 64 bits from here as long as the, those two 64 bits map to different channels. So I've given you bits and pieces, but let me generalize the memory structure. If you look at the memory controller, it's connected to a channel, and you have another memory controller that's connected to another independent channel, and the channel hosts multiple DIMMs, and each DIMM consists of multiple chips that are operated as a rank. Well, it can consist of multiple ranks, basically. In this case, we see a single rank. And within a, uh, within a chip, you have multiple banks, and within a bank, uh, you have a two-dimensional structure, columns and rows. And within a bank, you can think of multiple columns uh, to be hosting a cache line. So that's, some people call this the five-dimensional structure of DRAM. Because channel, rank, bank, column, row. That's the five dimensions. <laughs> and this is another view, and I'll let you look at it. So let's look at a, a top-down view. I've, I've, I've done this kind of bottom-up, right? We've started... Uh, with the bank, and we've built it up all the way to channel. Let's take a look at the top-down view. So this will give you a more system-level view of DRAM. And this is the top-down view. So if you look at your processor, you have different memory channels. In fact, I believe uh, in a Nehalem in a processor, you can have three memory channels. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, in, a, uh, in a Niagara system, you used to have eight memory channels. Those were costly systems. Uh, or maybe four memory channels, okay. But anyway, if you want to get high bandwidth, you want to have multiple memory channels. Uh, and each channel uh, consists of multiple DIMMs, as you can see here. And what does a DIMM look like? Well, uh, it looks like this. This is what you use, right? It's the front of the DIMM and the back of the DIMM. And you could have uh, two sides to it, which is rank zero and rank one, each of which is a collection of eight chips. And if you look at it in an abstract way, uh, each rank, it's connected to uh, a channel or part of a channel, part of a bus, right? They share uh, address, uh, uh, the, the data bus, which means that there is a MUX that selects between them, right? And there's a chip select for uh, the different ranks. And they share the address and command buses also, right? So this is your memory channel. Now, once you break down the rank, it consists of multiple chips, and they supply different parts of the data. Here, each chip is eight, eight bits, and they supply uh, altogether 64 bits. And you can break down the chip into its structure, which consists of multiple banks. In this case, you select between eight bits that are coming from different banks. And you can break down the bank into a row and column structure. Right? And you've seen this before. 16,000 rows and two kilobytes uh, total column, uh, row size. Okay, is this clear? So I'm not going to cover this, but even this bank consists of sub-banks to minimize latency. So it looks like this. A bank looks like this, except those sub-banks cannot be operated in parallel today. You can only enable one sub-bank. And one of your TAs, Yungu, has done work to enable parallel access between these sub-banks at low cost, which he's published recently. So if you do that, now you can parallelize the bank conflicts just by taking advantage of uh, the internal structure of a bank that also looks like banks internally. Except you don't do parallel access because you have a bunch of sub-banks here, let's say uh, 512 of these sub-banks, and if you had an address decoder for each of them, that would be very, very expensive. Right? Imagine 512 address decoders that are uh, being operated in parallel. That's very tough. So Jung has come up with mechanisms to pipeline the accesses, share the address decoders between these, but pipeline the accesses to different sub-banks so that you can partially parallelize bank conflicts. Make sense? So the memory is the same. It's a hierarchical structure that consists of these memory arrays that are aggregated as you go from top to bottom or bottom to top. Okay. 
So let's take a look at how a cache block is transferred uh, from uh, this uh, channel here. And this is, uh, this is uh, our physical memory address space, and this is our 64-byte cache block. It happens to be mapped to this DIMM. Let's take a look at how it's mapped uh, to that DIMM. Well, if you look at rank zero, rank zero consists of multiple chips, right? And we would like to get the cache block. Well, a cache block doesn't fit the entire interface, right? This is 64 bits, and we want 64 bytes, which means that we need to do eight accesses to get the entire cache block. Let's, and uh, the row zero, column zero, here maps our cache block. That's the first byte, right? Eight bits, uh, or first eight bytes. Eight bits come from here, the next eight bits come from here, dot, dot, dot. The eighth eight bit comes from here. This is our first 64 bits. And we get the first eight bytes that way. The second eight bytes are in column one. That's how we get the second eight bytes. The next eight bytes are in the next column. Basically, you read eight columns from this entire rank to transfer the entire cache block. Okay? So now DRM is not magic anymore. It's a complex system, but it's not magic. <laughs> okay, it's actually a simple system once you know the principles, right? So how do you, uh, what is the basic DRM operation? So the, the latencies, as you can see, uh, can be very high because even to transfer a single cache block, you need to do eight uh, accesses here. Uh, and the latency is actually higher than that. Basically, you need to, uh, to access uh, a location in DRAM, the CPU or the core uh, needs to transfer the address to the controller, to the memory controller, and then the request gets queued in the memory controller, and this can take uh, some, some amount of time depending on what other requests are being queued in the memory controller. And the access is later converted to basic commands, and there's controller to DRAM transfer time for the address. Right? Uh, basically, the controller needs to communicate with the DRAM bank. And DRAM bank latency is dependent on whether the row is open or closed, or if there's a row hit or a row conflict. And these are the commands. Uh, the, the column access uh, command, read or write, is also called a column access strobe. So if you hear the term CAS, it's column access strobe. It's a read or write. If you hear the term RAS, it's a row as address strobe. It's activate. And precharge is precharge, right? This is the worst case DRAM bank latency. So there's a DRAM bank latency to access the data, precharge, RAS, and CAS. That's the worst case. And also, there is a time to transfer the data on the bus. Right? And there, that, that I didn't add over here. So there's, uh, I guess that's here. There's DRAM to CPU transfer time, and you go through the controller also. And, the CPU, and then the controller needs to send the data to the CPU. So that's how the latencies get to hundreds of cycles. Right? And what's, what dominates the latency is really this bank access latency. Well, I guess queuing latency can dominate the latency too if you're backed up on the bank. But it, the unloaded latency is dominated by this bank access latency because the bank is still large. You need to drive those lo long bit lines and long word lines. Okay, I think we have talked about the interleaving. Uh, but if you want to have more concurrency, you need to reduce the bank conflicts and channel conflicts because bank access time dominates the unloaded latency, but these conflicts dominate uh, the loaded latency. Then the question becomes, how do you select or randomize the bank or channel indices in an address? Right. And I've already told you that. You can use lower order bits that have more entropy, and you can have randomizing hash functions. So address mapping becomes more interesting in this five-dimensional structure, right? Uh, I guess I'll, uh, this is how multiple banks and channels can help, right? Here, uh, if, you don't, if you have only a single bank or bank conflict, this is what you get. You wait for DRM access, and then you can start the next access and then you wait for it, and then you can start the next ad access. Whereas if, you, if these addresses go to different banks, or if you have multiple banks, you can, in consecutive cycles, start the accesses to different banks. In the first cycle, you can start the access to address zero, which is in bank zero. Next cycle, address one. Next cycle, address two. Next cycle, address three. And the DRM returns data in a pipeline fashion. So you can overlap the latencies. Even though you're not share, uh, you don't have separate address and data buses. You pipeline, you timeshare those buses. So the advantage of multiple channels is uh, increasing bandwidth and having multiple concurrency access in parallel. The disadvantage, you have higher cost, right? 
That's, that's the advantage and disadvantage of multiple banks also. But uh, the channels also have another disadvantage because channels uh, uh, require more pins, right? If you have a memory controller that's on chip, and most memory controllers going forward to the, uh, will be on chip if they're not already. Most systems today that you use have on-chip memory controllers. So the system is partitioned this way. You have a bunch of cores, and you have the memory controller, or multiple memory controllers. Uh, and you have some levels of caching. And the memory controller is connected to a channel, and you have dim tier. And multiple channels give you more bandwidth, but enables it comes at the expense of more pins. And also more board wires, right? Today, uh, people are examining technologies where they can stack memory on top of the chip. So if you look at uh, a 3D design, you have the processor, and you can put memory on top. Then you don't have the pins, but you can have these connections called through silicon vias. that are much smaller than pins. And that can directly connect to the processor. And you can have many more of them. Make sense? So this is called a stacked or die stacking. That's the basic idea. Actually, the principle is uh, simple. You have these true silicon vias where you can connect multiple dies together uh, without using pins. Uh, the, you can actually connect any kind of die, right? You can have processor, processor here. Uh, as long as you make sure the connections make sense, of course. This is called die stacking, and this is called die stacked memory. This can enable more bandwidth, of course. And in the future, you'll very likely see memories like this. This can enable more bandwidth. The downside of this approach is, you might imagine, right, there's some heat generated by the processor. Where does that heat go? Now it goes to that memory chip. So the temperatures usually are higher with this kind of system. But this is something you should be aware of going into the future. We, we will very likely have die stacked memories. And you can actually have multiple die stacked, right? Then your heat generation and heat, uh, heat sink problem <laughs> becomes harder because these uh, consume energy as well. OK. So that gets rid of some of the issues uh, with uh, more boards, wires, and more pins, right? If you have something like this, if you have a system like this, then you don't need more board wires. You just need more through silicon vias, which are less costly. But the trade-off is now you probably consume more power. Although even that's not exactly clear, because board wires actually consume a lot of power, too, in the system. OK, so let's get back to this address mapping. Address mapping becomes more interesting with DRAM. Uh, why is that? Uh, because you have this five-dimensional structure. right? Uh, I guess here, I don't exercise all of the five dimensions if you look at this. But there are two ways, uh, two common ways uh, in which data is interleaved in a D, uh, between different DRAM banks. One is called cache block interleaving, and the other is called row interleaving. And these are very common ways, uh, uh, common ways that are implemented in existing memory controllers. Cache block interleaving, consecutive cache block addresses are in consecutive banks. So you access one bank, you get a cache block which means that you can access another bank and you can get the next cache block, right? So this is one example. If you have a 2 gigabyte memory, 8 banks, 16K rows, and 2K columns per bank, this is what a row interleaved system looks like. Uh, actually, this is what a cache block interleaved system looks like. And I'll let you figure this out. Basically, you need to select the bank bits from the physical address such that consecutive cache blocks, 64 bytes, are in consecutive banks. And that's what this achieves, right? You have 64. Uh, you have, you've selected six bits, and the bank bits specify uh, which bank those bottom six bits actually belong to. Right? Okay? You can do row interleaving. Basically, now your consecutive rows of memory are in consecutive banks. So this, this enables you to have, uh, when you bring in a row uh, from uh, and the DRAM array all the way into the row buffer, you have consecutive addresses in that row. Right? Whereas with cache block interleaving, you don't have consecutive addresses in the row. Right? 
Does that make sense? So if you look at your, mm, let's say you have two banks. Bank zero, bank one. That's your row buffer. If you have cache block until leaving, cache block zero is here, cache block one is here, two is here, three is here. Which means that when you bring in a row, consecutive addresses are in consecutive banks. Whereas if you have row interleaving, let's say a row has 64 blocks, you have a cache block 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 all the way to 63 in the same row, and 64, 65, dot, 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 all the way to 127 in the next bank in the same row. And you have 128 in this uh, bank. So when you look at the row buffer, the row buffer contains consecutive addresses here. Whereas here it doesn't. And if you have many, many more banks, then uh, you definitely, uh, the distance between consecutive uh, addresses in the row buffer will be higher in the memory. So this, uh, that way, uh, if, you, if you actually have this row interleaving, this is good for streaming accesses, right? What you do, if what you do is actually access an entire uh, row in a streaming manner, if this is your access pattern, 0 through 63, now you brought all 0 through 63 uh, cache blocks in one shot into the row buffer, and the controller can hit in the row buffer in consecutive cycles. That's how you can maximize your bandwidth. That's the benefit of row interleaving. The, uh, it's row, so row interleaving is very good for streaming accesses. Because uh, the, memory, uh, the DRAM is page mode DRAM. You can do consecutive accesses to the same row in consecutive cycles. This is uh, cache block interleaving, or sometimes called line interleaving. Now, if you look at this, this is very good for random accesses, right? If you have multiple accesses in parallel, what you want is uh, to be able to access one cache block from here, and hopefully an independent cache block that has nothing to do with, this address, with the address of this cache block from here. So you can have a cache block 5 accessed from here, and cache, well, 5 will not be here, right? depending on my interleaving mechanism, but cache block 16 from here and cache block 85 from here. That way you can get that easily, and you don't need stream data. Okay, I'll let you figure out uh, the rest. You can think about this a little bit. Actually, address mapping becomes more complicated, so it can make your head hurt. Sometimes it makes my head hurt. And you'll see why. <laughs> but basically, Regardless, in either of these systems, you would like to minimize bank conflicts. So how do you do that? And existing controllers do this. Uh, DRAM controller can randomize the address mapping so that banks, uh, bank conflicts are less likely. And one way of doing that is, instead of taking consecutive bits from the address, randomize this. And one way of randomizing it is actually taking some other bits and XORing them together with the bank bits, bank index. Uh, XORing them together with uh, other bits to form the bank index. You can imagine more sophisticated hash functions here, but XOR is usually a simple one. Okay, now your, your head is going to hurt more, perhaps. <laughs> so if you look at this five-dimensional structure, and I'm not sure if I still have the five dimensions here. Maybe I do. Uh, if you have multiple channels, now you have this other dimension, right? Where do you place the channel bits? How do you interleave the data? Now if you look at these, where are the consecutive cache blocks? Well, you could even, uh, do finer gain. Other, you have other choices, right? Where do you actually place channel bits here? I'm not going to answer that question. And this turns out to be a tough problem. It's not that easy to figure out what's the best policy. Uh, and if you come up with a policy that is heterogeneous, that's probably a good idea too. Because you would, sometimes you would like this mapping and sometimes you would like some other mapping, right? Depending on your patterns, access patterns. This is very similar to sometimes you would like a row major order Sometimes you like a column major order, but you cannot get both, right? Your data is laid out already. Address mapping is similar to that. 
And there's also this interaction with virtual to physical mapping, which we briefly looked at uh, toward the end in the last lecture. So the operating system influences where an address maps to a DRAM through this virtual to physical number translation, right? Frame number, uh, virtual page number to physical frame number translation. And the bits that change during that translation can affect what bank or what channel, if there's a channel bit that's coming from here, or what rank or what row a virtual page is mapped to. An operating system can influence that. So it can perform page coloring to minimize bank conflicts. Uh, and it may, maybe we'll, if we get to it, for example, it can also minimize application interference. So if, you, if it figures out that two applications are mapped to the different cores, it can say, I'd like to map the pages of this application here and this ap other application here right, by influencing that choice, uh, by influencing which virtual pages of this app, uh, by, by ensuring that virtual pages of, of this application are allocated physical frames from this stem and virtual pages of this application are allocated physical frames for, from this stem. Uh, so in today's systems, operating systems actually don't do that. So operating systems, the, the structure of the DRAM system is not exposed to the system software. So they cannot make a very intelligent decision because the operating system doesn't know where the bank bits come from in the physical address. So this memory controller, in fact, the memory controller does randomization within itself. It uses a hash function to map the address to different banks, which means that the operating system doesn't have control. But going forward into the future, especially as we design multiple uh, uh, multi-core systems, we would probably like to expose the structure of this DRAM into uh, the chip, into, this, uh, into the system software so that you can do more intelligent page mapping. So this is something, again, you should be aware of. The system that, as I described, uh, is designed this way, but going forward into the future, we would like to change some things. Uh, because, again, if the software has no control on where the data is allocated, then you can get significant bank conflicts. In GPUs, for example, the, uh, the uh, one way of getting high performance is ensuring that the programmer allocates data such that you don't get, get cache conflicts or you, you don't get bank conflicts. Right? So you need to expose those, the structure of the DRAM to the programmer somehow. That structure is not fully exposed today. If you look at the GPU manuals, GPU manuals tell you to do some things but they don't tell you exactly why. Right? Maybe you can figure out exactly why if you actually understand the system. But why is because you, you would like to maximize the bandwidth that's coming out of uh, the pins. And if you lay out your data such that you always access consecutive locations in consecutive uh, in, the, uh, in the threads, in the warp, in different, in consecutive threads in the warp, that way you maximize your bandwidth because the data is mapped such that consecutive locations can go to consecutive banks. Right. Enable multiple banks to be operated in parallel. But if you don't lay out your data nicely such that you access location five, location seven, location nine, uh, well, that may not be a good example, location 77, it may be that your warps now need to uh, now cannot do parallel access to memory, right? Because one warp needs to access memory location five, another warp needs to access another row in the same bank. Well, too bad. Now these warps need to be serialized, but you want these warps to operate in parallel. Right? If you had exposed this mapping, maybe the programmer would know uh, how to lay out the data, or the operating system would know how to lay out the data. Okay. Any questions? So I think. Uh, I've challenged you a little bit to think, rethink the system today. I'm giving you some fundamental principles and giving you how the system is designed, but going forward, things will change. So it's good to uh, figure out uh, how you would actually, or think about how you would design the system such that you have a much better system that uh, cooperates between the hardware and the software. I think I will stop here. We'll study the fascinating topic of DRAM refresh We'll start with that uh, in the next lecture.
and we'll continue with the memory hierarchy. So maybe what we'll do is we will, we will have a recitation on Friday uh, you, where you can ask questions about uh, the lab and maybe Justin will cover other things than the lab also. And we'll, we'll start with the lecture next Monday. <laughs>